Maintaining political or policy momentum, very important. We have a remarkable amount of advancements going on in mission architecture design, innovation. It's just a remarkable time period, but policy is still extraordinarily important. This, you know, we need to find a way to maintain momentum, get all the different political parties, different, you know, partners, international and domestic, to work together to maintain, you know, an aggressive timeline. Because, you know, as we know with this organization, we want to get to the surface of Mars by the mid-2030s. So to achieve that, we need solid political momentum. So to lead the discussion is Mike French, who is a well-respected ex expert in space policy. Okay and has participated in um, H2M and other events uh, we've run you know, over the last few years many times. Mike is the Vice President for Space Systems at, um, at the Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, previously, he served as the Senior Vice President for Commercial Space at Bryce Space and Technology, and he is a former Chief of Staff for NASA. So ladies and men, gentlemen, Mike French. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining us here in the room and online. I'm really excited about this panel. We've got uh, as, as deep a set of expertise across the government uh, as you could get to talk about this topic today. Uh, so I'll quickly uh, introduce, uh, introduce the folks here. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Brian Israel from NASA. Uh, then we have uh, Ezene Ozo Okuru from the White House, OSTP. We have Jean Toll Eisen from Senate Appropriate, the Senate Appropriations Committee, and we have Tom Hammond from the House Science Committee. And maybe I'll just spend, uh, if we could just spend a minute explaining a bit of what you do in the policy landscape, uh, each of you. I think that'll be useful for our audience uh, today. So Brian, maybe I'll just start with you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon. I lead the, the International National Security and Space Law Practices at NASA in the Office of General Counsel. So as you might be familiar, much of what NASA does involves international partners, foreign space agencies, and a lot of that cooperation is structured around international agreements or, or, or treaties. Um, and so my office primarily supports uh, sort of negotiation of those international agreements. Um, the uh, governance of space itself is, is inherently international and, and the law governing it um, involves a significant um, international law component. And so my, my team is also very much involved in uh, interpreting and applying this legal framework uh, to what we're doing now and what we plan to do in the future. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Ezene? Uh, thanks, Mike, for having me. Um, good afternoon, all. So the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, has a strong science and technology focus on all areas of, um, all disciplines and all areas of policy. And the space portfolio focuses on topics like orbital debris, topics like um, human exploration, topics like space weather and earth observations, and uh, planetary protection and other uh, topics of importance to this administration and as um, included in the U.S. Space Priorities Framework. Great. Thank you, Esne. Uh, Jean? Hi, my name is Jean Toll Eisen, and I am the clerk or staff director of the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee. And that's a lot of words to say that we spend the people's money. Um, so we, um, our subcommittee deals with the Department of Commerce, the Justice Department, and science agencies like NASA and the National Science Foundation. and. Uh, makes the decision on how to allocate resources among the different programs at NASA and throughout the whole portfolio. Yeah, yeah thank you, Gene. Uh, Tom? Hi, uh, Tom Hammond. I work for the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, House side. I uh, work for the minority staff. Uh, the House Science Committee was founded in 1958 after uh, the Sputnik launch. It was inter uh, its predecessor committee was uh, part of the founding of creating NASA in 1958, uh, the, the original Space Act. Uh, as an authorizing committee in the House, we, as it uh, sounds like, we authorize programs uh, focused on our jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction is outer space, uh, including NASA. We uh, also have some aspects of NOAA satellite programs, uh, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and Office of Space Commerce. Uh, so we cover the, the breadth of civil space uh, authorizations. We set policy uh, guidelines, grant authorizations for activities, pro pro programs, projects, and activities, and set funding caps and uh, funding profile guidance for the appropriators uh, uh, 
as recommendations that they should follow. Excellent. We'll get a bit more into that, uh, you know, maybe a little later in this panel. Uh, so we, the, the panel is about maintaining uh, policy momentum. So before we get into the maintaining, I think it'd be uh, good to get your sense of where is, where is today's policy? Uh, maybe I'll start as an A, you know, from the White House to administration perspective, uh, when we think about the exploration policy uh, and exploration, uh, the role of moon, Mars, can you tell us a bit about, you know, where, where, that, where the administration's policy lies today? Absolutely. So as I uh, mentioned, the U.S. Space Priorities Framework is a document that was released last December at the inaugural Space Council meeting. And what that document does is describe our vision for space and space policy priorities. And um, three of the top themes you'd see in that document are around developing space norms. They're around um, using all our tools and satellites and capabilities to help uh, mitigate uh, climate change. They are around um, ensuring that we continue to lead in science and technology and um, research activities. However, um, there are also key points in that document that discuss our leadership of human exploration to, to the moon and, uh, and beyond. So when we think of you know, the Artemis Accords and um, the Artemis program, and the advancements that NASA have, uh, has been making uh, in the development of its um, rockets and other systems that will be flying. We see it as a very exciting time um, for space and it aligned uh, squarely with our space priorities and uh, we are very supportive of, of what's to come. Great, thank you, Stan. So, so Tom, uh, when we think about today's policy, the authorizers obviously a very relevant role there today. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, where you see that, where, where you see from the authorizer's perspective, where, where, where is today's space policy? You know, how does Mars fit in it? How does Moon fit in it? Yeah, so one caveat, I'm not speaking on behalf of the committee, so I have to say that as a congressional staffer. I work for people to make decisions. I don't actually make them myself, so uh, refer to all of their statements on this rather than mine. Um, but, uh, so the authorizing committee has a unique perspective in that we're not, we usually don't think of things on a year-to-year a -year fiscal basis. We think long term. Many of our authorizations span multi, many different years, and they're intent on maintaining continuity of purpose or making small changes as necessary throughout the process. So think of it as more of a, uh, an aircraft carrier rather than a speedboat, right? We're going to make small changes along the way, but the goal is to maintain that continuity of purpose. Um, so if you look back to the last several authorizations, the last authorization we did was in 2017. Before that, it was in 2010. Before that, was in 2005. All of those were uh, very uh, similar and consistent throughout in terms of setting a, ste a stepping stone approach to exploration, using the moon as a stepping stone to get to Mars and then uh, beyond. Regardless of administration, um, you know, Congress has been consistent throughout for the last 20 years in doing that. We've had small recommended changes from various administrations, as, as they will, um, and most will. Uh, but for the whole, Congress has been fairly consistent uh, across that time period. Like I said, there are small you know, changes, whether it was an asteroid retrieval mission or canceled programs, but largely uh, Congress has been consistent of maintaining that. So, you know, in terms, I think the, the, the title of this panel is Maintaining Momentum or something like that. I think at, in terms of good news stories, we are, and Congress has been maintaining that momentum because when you talk about space exploration, this isn't something you can, you know, knock out in a year or two, right? When we're talking yep. about, you know, going to, the, returning to the moon, going to Mars, these are multi-generation, multi-different uh, administrations, and it, it's, in some extent, you know, you're going to see companies come and go in between. Uh, so you have to maintain that continuity, and Congress has been pretty good about it, I think. Gene, oh. what are your thoughts on that? So you, you work on an annual, the appropriations process on an annual basis. Um, you know, how do you see, uh, how, does, how, does, how does the annual process sort of fit with uh, the continuity that Tom's talking about, and, and, and has it, from your perspective, been maintained? Is that continuity there? Well, and I'll, I'll express the same caveat that Tom did, which is, you know, I'm just staff here. And, uh, and, but I, I'll offer my perspective from that, uh, from that perch. And what I'll say is um, you need, budget is policy and appropriations is policy. So to the extent that um, we have a roadmap from the authorizers, we also need the appropriations resources to map that roadmap to, 
to meet that roadmap in order to actually get and maintain momentum. We're at, I think, a very interesting point where we're starting to see what can be. We're about to see big launches. We are seeing great data come back from Perseverance. Everybody loves Ingenuity. Um, 28 flights, we thought it would have five. And so people are excited. And the other thing that is exciting is we have a broad coalition and have for more than a decade of people in the Senate and the House of Representatives on a bipartisan basis who share this vision. And the good thing has been it's people who are interested in human exploration and people who are interested in scientific exploration. And the cool thing about the moment we're in now, especially if you think about Mars is, and the moon, the science and the human the robotic and the human are really coming together and enabling one another in ways that we've talked about for a long time, but I think we're going to be able to see in the next few years, and that's going to get people excited. We always have the competition, not just among the various disciplines at NASA or across the Commerce Justice Science Bill, but across government as a whole. How much are we going to put into domestic? How much are we going to put into events? So the, the limitation that, that we have on the Appropriations Committee is just how much is in our wallet? How much do we have to spend? But I do think there is a, a policy momentum that, uh, that is shared with the authorizers and, and shared across House and Senate. So. Yeah. Um. And so let's so sort of establish. It seems we've got a fairly broad consensus, consensus hearing from the three of you, of the, of of human to Mars uh, you know, approach with with Moon um, exploration, uh, benefiting uh, eventual Mars exploration. So how do we keep that going? Um, what what are the gaps or what are the decisions that that we need to be making uh, here in the near term? Uh, you know, to, to maintain that that consensus to the extent we have it. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in in there first on that. I can start. So OSCP, again, focuses on science and technology. And as Jean mentioned, when you focus on the science that's required for, for um, lunar exploration, for, um, for Mars, then you have things like the in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing uh, national strategy that we released that focuses on ways that we are looking to encourage the interagency to the U.S. government to advance R&D, ways to accelerate commercial um, innovation, ways to expand and prioritize key infrastructure like robotics that are needed for you know, these technologies that are necessary. So I think that um, ensuring that we have more of these, um, signaling that we have more of these capabilities and that we are ready to mature these capabilities, we are ready to adopt um, additional capabilities to help us meet um, these goals that are set by our budget, I think are important. And the second area is just on um, advancing technology uh, research overall. Because uh, when you think about areas like space nuclear power and propulsion, for instance, that may not be needed now may not be needed in five years, but would be helpful in the future, and ensuring that we continue the research that advances that work, um, supports not just our lunar missions in the near term, but also supports our future exploration goals. No, thanks, Disney. Uh, Tom, uh, it, it seems that a, a clear one may be a, another authorization act. Is that is that an easy answer? <laughs> no, there's pros and cons to that, right? Uh, luckily, unlike uh, the Department of Defense, NASA's authorized at such sums in perpetuity and has been since 1958. That's the good thing. We don't have to scramble at the end of the calendar year, fiscal year, to get an authorization done. Um, but the flip side of the coin is there's not you know, that impetus to, to re-engage and to revisit, to find consensus on some questions that may you know, benefit from that consensus. So that, that motivation, there's always a push and pull there. Um, is it good to have an authorization? Absolutely. It's, it provides 
the agency, it provides stakeholders, and provides um, you know, the public with a, a common understanding of NASA's goals and reaffirmation of those. So I think it, it is positive in that aspect. Um, but to do one, just to do one, um, you know, it, it depends, because there are a lot of trades and a lot goes into that. But I think you know, it would benefit, I think NASA would benefit from a, a reauthorization right now. Um, I know my colleagues on the House uh, Science Committee, we're all working towards that right now. Uh, the last one we did was a transition act. It was only one year to get us between um, uh, the Obama administration and the Trump administration, provide that continuity of purpose. So um, luckily, the, the current administration hasn't really deviated that far from the, the, the current program of record. So uh, things are consistent. I think if you saw significant changes, you, there may be more of an impetus to move faster. But I, at this point, I, I think everybody that I've talked with on Capitol Hill is interested in doing an authorization and getting one done pretty soon. So to provide that, that continuity and reaffirmation. Hmm. Uh, Gene, I'm interested, you know, your thoughts here on the maintain continuity. One thing I'll throw out there is you know, you'll sometimes hear in policy circles this idea that it would be great if NASA could be appropriated for multiple years. Um, any you know thoughts on is that is that even a, is is that just a misread kind of maybe of how things work or is that uh, is yeah, that stop is that dreaming. something? <laughs> but I I mean I'll go back to what Tom said about an aircraft carrier like this is not this is just because there's an annual appropriations bill doesn't mean it's a speedboat it's still an aircraft carrier it is it is hard to to change course, it is hard to um, cancel things. And part of that is the advocacy that, that you all are, are engaged in and the advocacy that a lot of other folks um, around this town are engaged in. It is, and, and I think that that's one of the things that um, folks who wanna make sure that we don't just stop at the moon and we don't just launch something and then say did it we're done um focus on because those technologies that we just talked about nuclear propulsion um in space servicing i hear those and think good thing that we had an appropriations committee to invest in those when they weren't in the budget um and that goes across administrations believe me um but it's really hard to invest in those long-term technologies, those enabling technologies, because the pressure is, what are we gonna do to get sample return off the ground? What are we gonna do to get the, the near-term problems that we have? And what gets sacrificed is, yes, the infrastructure like the bridge to Wallops Island, you know, doesn't get fixed because we just don't have that in the plan, things that are construction. But the other thing that gets sacrificed is those long-term technologies because you're in a one-year process. So you're saying, what do I need right now? What are the problems I can fix right now? And you're not trying to fix a 10-year problem. Mm -hmm. Well, Brian, I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. And so I, 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 you know, certainly in the policy circles, we talk about gaps or, or a need for, um, uh, you know, something that's sometimes called in-space authority or mission authorization, um, you know, something in the U.S. government uh, that provides um, uh, treaty-level obligations to activities of U.S. actors. Is this something, when we think about Mars exploration or even lunar exploration, exploration is there a gap here? Is this, is this, a, is this an important um, policy debate or decision that, that we need here in the near term? Um, certainly, so just, just to, to, to level set, if, you, if you're not familiar with um, uh, the, to, to, for, for a private uh, entity to do something in space requires um, actually several licenses from, from regulators. And um, the, 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 the way this fits into um, the international system uh, is that the, the Outer Space Treaty, the, the sort of center of the legal framework for activities in outer space, um, makes uh, states, parties, governments legally responsible for uh, what their nationals do in space and imposes a, sort of an affirmative obligation on them to continually supervise non-governmental ac activities in space and ensure their conformity with the provisions of the treaty. Why would it do that? Well, if you think about um, uh, space is this area, this, this sort of only domain of human activity that's 
that's never been ordered around territorial sovereignty. There is no, there is no sovereign there. How do you get sort of a single set of rules of the road for all the actors in this shared space? Well, the answer for, for like the last half century has been um, you negotiate the rules on the international plane and then um, uh, you know, those rules bind governments and governments extend those uh, basic rules to, to private actors under their jurisdiction. And so we do that today through licensing frameworks um, operated by the FAA that licenses launch and reentry of spacecraft. The Federal Communications Commission uh, licenses communications to and from space. And uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration licenses remotely sensing the Earth. There are a, a number of, uh, of sort of contemplated activities um, that color outside the lines of the um, uh, sort of the licensing frameworks we have, the authorities those regulators have, um, and, and raise some real questions about, um, you know, can't, like, how can the United States fulfill its sort of treaty obligations in relation to those activities, and um, is, uh, is the government able to sort of provide the level of um, certainty, stability, um, that, that those private operators um, uh, need to sort of order their affairs. And this is something near and dear to my heart, also having been a, uh, a general counsel of, a, of an asteroid mining company uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a prior life. Um, I, 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 I thought of this more as, as, as a, you know, next five to 10 year, year space activities problem. I, I, I hadn't thought about it in terms of um, uh, humans, a, a, a humans to Mars problem. Um, but, but, but I think the, 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 the solution in the next sort of, you know, few years um, could, could also um, uh, provide at least the beginning of a solution for sort of um, more audacious things like human, inter interplanetary human spaceflight. No, thanks, Brian. Is this, uh, Tom, I'll turn to you as, you know, from the authorization hat. Is this an area that you all are thinking about? We've thought about it for a long time. And in Brian's previous lives, we've <laughs> talked several times about this in the past as well. So uh, in 20, what year is that now? I think it was 2017, the last time that, uh, I think the, the House considered legislation was passed by voice vote unanimously, uh, was American Space Commerce Free Enterprise, which created a, a light touch uh, approach to satisfying the, the international treaty obligations that, that Brian's talking about. Um, it's important to note, and I think, I hope Brian would agree with me, that we're not in violation of any of our treaty obligations right now, right? Um, but that, that we, that the, our obligations could be met more clearly and it could be more, done more efficiently. I think at, at last time I checked with uh, either CRS or GAO, there was 50 some touch points that a, a commercial operator has to go through or it could be uh, um, subject to, to an agency's jurisdiction at some point. So there's, there's a, we have one of the most regulated spacefaring nations as it is right now. Unlike some other countries where you could probably just go to a, a basement and get a rubber stamp on, on your, uh, for your approval. So I think there is that balance there of, you know, making sure that we're providing certainty, but not confusing the situation by saying, you know, that we're not meeting our obligations right now. Um, but uh, to, to your point, um, at least the House did pass a uh, mis mission authorization certification, a way of more clearly meeting uh, our, our obligations. But it, it all harkens back to the Outer Space Treaty, and you know, at, at the time, it was largely negotiated between the United States and, and the Soviet Union, which had very different uh, perspectives on how you regulated and governed uh, their, their peoples. So I think that manifests itself uh, to some extent today. We live in a constitutional republic, uh, um, so you know we we tend to allow our private systems to do a little bit more than probably a, a communist regime did back in the 60s. Uh, I don't mean to leave uh, uh, Esnader Jean out of this uh, you know mission authorization conversation. I don't know if you if you want to you know jump in on this. I mean, I, I, as I think about it and think about mo maintaining momentum, um, the private activities that are going on in space are obviously something that is not just exciting the American people, but exciting members of Congress. And I think the, the question that, that folks ask, at least in, in the policy circles I run in, is what happens beyond the billionaire. Is there a way that you're going to see that the humans to Mars, that those humans are, you know, 
humans and not just a specific small subset of humans. Um, I don't know if that goes to the sort of larger poli policy context, but it's certainly one of the things I think about when I think about all of the private activities that we have that are both essential and complementary to the public activities that, that are going on. Uh, what I will add to that is that it is something we are actively working on, actually. Uh, so the National Space Council is uh, working on, not just on orbit, authorization, but also mission authorization, um, and just looking at our regulatory frameworks and having those conversations. So um, I think that with time, you know, we, we might have a position to share. Okay, yeah. great. So no news for us today. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> well, I want to make sure that uh, we've got an incredible panel here that I want to make sure the audience has access to. So, uh, why don't we, if, if audience does has qu have questions, please, uh, you know, why don't you let the, the folks out there out there know? Because I want to make sure that we uh, include you all in this discussion. Um, and so, if, if the folks gathering questions, uh, yep, sir, here. Yep. Hi. Can you? Oh yeah, it's on. Yes. Um, there is something which uh, has really intrigued me a lot, which is uh, uh, for energy solutions on Earth, which can supply enough energy for a thousand years or something like that. It's thorium molten salt reactor, which I've look, really looked into, and it's very, very attractive and it's quite amazing for terrestrial power, etc. But it also has a fantastic possibility of application for off-planet energy on the moon, Mars, and also for cislunar space. Uh, why are we not looking at that? It doesn't seem like we have NASA was in, it's, it's very nice to hear that we are all now sort of looking at nuclear uh, energy and nuclear power and, and all that. So in this, in that, um, I would say that we should be looking at that and we really are not. Well, I'd say, well, you know, sort of thinking about this probably from, from some of these folks' lens, when you have a technology, a, sort of a new technology or different technology um, that may have this kind of potential, sort of how does that find its way, you know, sort of to the, into the policy discussion? Maybe, Gene, you may be the most at this, you may be at the yeah, tip no, of the spear I on mean, that. I, yeah. I, um, I think that the question raises a really interesting point, which is another thing I sort of thought about coming in here, which is that we don't just explore for exploration's sake. Certainly our curiosity is part of it, but we do it for all kinds of other reasons, and those are the reasons that resonate with policymakers and ultimately with the their constituents who they answer to. And part of that is of course, um, America's world standing, soft power, etc. But another part of that is that we truly believe that the things we can do in space will help us here on Earth. Whether it is clean energy, that's yes, the energy we need to power something somewhere else, but can also help us here on Earth, or all kinds of other technologies that uh, go back and forth. And so I actually think that when you have a new technology and a technology with potential, it's a yes and, and it can be something that is um, not another reason to go exploring. Yeah, no, that's true. Is there another question there? I saw uh, uh, the Go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, so yeah, so George Curley uh, with the Planetary Society and the Alliance for Space Development. Uh, so I'd like to ask a question about uh, planetary protection. So specifically, uh, NASA was given a mandate to identify asteroids which could pose a threat to the Earth or to cities on the Earth, and given time frames to identify those particular objects. And to that end, there was a NEO surveyor mission, which was uh, you know, on the books. Um, that is within the NASA Science Directorate. This year, the funding for that was pulled and then all, was clawed back, and then also 2023 was vastly reduced. So is this something that, uh, you know, is there any background to this, why this happened? And 
you know, perhaps should planetary protection or planetary defense, you know, even belong in the science directorate. Maybe that's something DHS should be doing or, or something. Maybe, maybe it's NASA's not, not their interest or, or could you add some context to that? Yeah. Well, so it's something we struggle with. Uh, that, that direction is the Georgie Brown Near Earth Object Survey Act. I was Act. an authorizer yes. when that got passed. Yes, we're in the same room. <laughs> it's 2005. Um, so that directed, as you say, to find 90% of 140 meter uh, potentially hazardous asteroids by 20 years. We're coming up on that. I think they're at about 30 something percent about this point. Um, hopefully, Vera Rubin will bring that on hot, uh, bring, bring, bring that up. Uh, at some point. However, with Arecibo, um, you know, the collapse of Arecibo and for characterization that will significantly impact it. The plan was to use Neo Surveyor. Um, Congress has been very supportive of Neo Surveyor as well as building out and completing the survey. And it's not a, um, you, a you should do, it is a shall do. Um, so when NASA develops its budget and figures out what they're going to prioritize, you'd think that that would be very high on the list since they're directed to do it. So that's part of the, the, the oversight process that we do uh, on authorizing committees to make sure that they're following through and accomplishing their tasks. So it's something we pay attention to. It's something members are very engaged on as well. Um, it's, uh, we've held, uh, after Chelly events, we held a series of hearings in the committee on that and we followed through um, on you know, regular updates and meeting that. They, NASA did create the Planetary Defense Coordination Officer position making a lot of strides, but it, it, this is a, is a weird area because most of what NASA does in their science mission director is keyed towards decadal survey recommendations and achieving science. In this instance, we're talking about a mission-directed uh, uh, activity, right? An agency-directed mission that's not directly tied to science but does have a national impact. So to your point, I think NASA's probably the right place to do it, whether or not it's in the Planetary Science Division, in the Science Mission Director, or somewhere else at NASA. Uh, I think that you can make arguments in different areas, but I think the priority of completing the survey is very high in the minds of at least people that I work for. And, and, and uh, surveys of the general public have, have indicated there's broad, broad support amongst the general public for this too. So yep. we're just curious, I mean, both organizations have been curious why the funding was cut so drastically and where that came from. So are we. <laughs> I mean, I will give you a little bit of context about FY, 22 and uh, fiscal year 2022, so the current year budget, and then looking at the next year's budget. So when we think about budgets, when we think about appropriations um, rather than budgets, we look at what the president requested, and then we look at what the allocation the committee and the subcommittees have. and. At the end of the day, rather than a 16% increase in non-defense discretionary, so the part of the spending that NASA is in, that was cut significantly and cut almost in half um, from a Senate level that was reduced from what the president had requested for non-defense broadly across 11 domestic subcommittees. And so that, that ended up being that when I talked to my colleagues in other non-defense subcommittees, you were really looking at a, an increase that kept your agencies up with inflation and allowed them to, to uh, normalize a lot of things that they'd been doing with bailing wire over the past three or four years, but didn't really provide those significant new increases that the administration had requested. We're looking at another budget request for FY23, where the defense request is a 4% increase. The non-defense increase is significantly higher at some point, because we live in a 50-50 Senate and you gotta get 60 votes to pass an appropriations bill, we're gonna see a place where that is put back into some kind of parity or balance. And at that moment, the non-defense side of the House, 
the side that funds NASA is not going to get as much of an increase as was requested in the budget request. And then starting, then you get back to where I was before, where starting new things is harder than keeping things going. You start looking at what are the things that need to launch this year or next year, and let's prioritize those things first before we start ramping up newer missions. And so that's sort of the balance that we're in is that um, as a boss I used to have, uh, used to say, um, I, I'm a size 12 girl trying to get into a size six dress. That's what NASA is, a size 12 girl trying to get into a size six dress. So. We're trying to at least give her a size eight, but we're not there yet. I don't know, Esne, or, or do, do you want to comment on the planetary defense side of things? Frankly, I think Jean answered it perfectly. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, Brian, don't take CFOs on this. CFOs answer on this. <laughs> yeah. no. Excellent. I know we've got a few. I just want to say, is, is someone, and on, someone on this side at the mic here? Yeah, sir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Robert Howard. I'm a habitability design engineer at Johnson Space Center. My question is, all my life there's been some sort of study or program or initiative surrounding exploration beyond low Earth orbit, and they've all been canceled. So my question, I know that there's support today, but there was support a decade ago too. What's different today with Artemis that we can have confidence that we'll see some sort of human presence on the moon and Mars that will endure as opposed to Real Apollo life hardware. Stuff? Say again? Real live hardware. Okay. <gasps> Apollo 18. Yep. Re real I'm, I, I'm saying what's different than 10 years ago, and it's real live hardware. Okay. Okay. Uh, any others on that one? Good question. Yeah, it's, a, it's an issue that we pay attention to a lot. I mean, you can just go back, it's, at least in the near history of Space Exploration Initiative, Constellation, attempts to cancel SLS and Orion. Um, you know, I, I, I get back to the first thing I started with uh, today, though, is we've actually seen that constancy of purpose now across administrations, across Congresses, differing chairs and rankings, party ch switches in terms of control of Congress, party changes in administrations. Um, and you've seen at least now, and there is, a, there is that constancy of purpose. Um, I know people have other ideas and Different stakeholders have different arguments about what could be done better now than before, but you know we're talking about multi-generational and multi-decade kind of programs here. So, you know, I we all, I mean we have a launch vehicle that's in the VAB about ready to roll out for Artemis One. I mean, that's we have hard we have hardware. And we have follow-on plans that are invested not just for Artemis One. I mean, there's hardware you know being delivered down at the Cape. There's hardware that's being developed at Nishud right now. Um, you know, th there is that that tail is already developing. The question is though, do we end up stopping somewhere and do we have dead-end technologies? Are, are these technologies and capabilities extensible for future exploration? So that's, that's really the, I mean, the and I think that's the real future. question about momentum is how do, we, how do we make sure that we don't do something and stop? And, and part of it is planning and sustainability and the really the policies that the administration and NASA are advocating for and, and looking beyond how long those administrations can last. And part of it is having the coalition of policymakers and advocates um, who are encouraging multiple administrations to do that. And um, so that's why I think that um, when you look you know, I'm, I'm a Senate girl through and through, and I think back when I started doing this and you had Senator Hutchison of Texas and Senator Shelby of Alabama, who's still there, and Senator Mikulski of Maryland, and Senator Nelson of Florida. Do you know what he's doing now? <laughs> um, and it was sort of, they thought of themselves as a space coalition. And, um, it was nice, but they all had a reason to be in a space coalition because they were from Texas and Maryland and Alabama and Florida 
And if you look in the Senate at some of the new space advocates, they're from New Hampshire and Kansas and Arizona and Colorado and not the states that you think of as the space states. And I think broadening what we think of as the space states and who's interested and who benefits and how humans benefit in yours to the endurance of momentum. Good point. I don't know, is there anything, anything on that? I will add two things. I think that uh, we can pull on the thread of hardware a bit and also at least acknowledge the, just the substantial um, advancements that have happened in space in the last decade before when Constellation was a project. I was in the Constellation program. I was on Orion. Uh, so we have seen also this um, a proliferation, if you will, of um, technologies that not only, I think, inspire others within the commercial space, but actually inspire civil agencies also to see what um, they can do to improve those programs. And then another um, thing I, I will like to echo is what Tom and Jean have been you know, talking a lot about, which is continuity here. And this is one policy that is certainly uh, um, of interest and a top priority for this administration to land the first woman on the moon, to land the first uh, person of color um, on the moon. And when you think about um, some, some of the other reasons uh, behind that, whether it's um, having, having additional um, opportunities to partner with our allies or strategic competition. So there are a confluence of reasons. And I think that you know, when you put them all together and um, we are you know, living in a moment where it is time. Okay. Let's, uh, here in the front. Hi, my name's Keelan. Um, so I have a quick question. When you're looking at uh, policy momentum, I don't think it just happens in a vacuum in the United States. I think there is some international influence. And as we're looking at adversarial states like Russia and China testing ASATs and ASAT development and having more of a destabilization in the space arena, how can that sort of new volatile near space affect our momentum here in the United States as we try to move forward to achieve these really great programs? I want to start with Brian on that question. What do you think, Brian? <laughs> um, so, I mean, in answering the last question, as I touched a little bit on sort of strategic or sort of great power competition actually as a, a possible force of momentum uh, or sort of in investment and exploration in space um, to, to the extent that policymakers care about um, you know, parity or sort of, or, or exceeding sort of great power co competitors who, who, are, who are moving out uh, in exploration, um, that, that is an impetus. Um, it, things, things like um, uh, ASAT test demonstrations uh, can, pr can present, of course, obvious, like real near-term operational hazards. Um, uh, I, I think the, the reaction we, we've, we've seen so far has been so somewhat unifying. Um, it, it, it's sort of, it was a, a prompt to, um, at least this is just what, what I sort of personally received or sort of experienced. Um, uh, it, 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 it sort of drew out that there was a fair bit of uni uniformity in, um, uh, in, in sort of what, what sort of norms we should have around this. Um, and so uh, that, uh, that doesn't kill you, makes, maybe makes, makes you stronger um, in, the, in the near term. I will say that, um, you know, we've been very clear about this and this is something we've been um, working on before the, the uh, November 15 ASAT test. Um, actually, and at the inaugural Space Council meeting, also one of the actions that was given to the National Security Council was to um, develop space norms. And last month, Pres uh, Vice President Harris mentioned our policy on banning ASAT tests. So, um, you know, we are very clear, um, as was mentioned earlier, about uh, following international law and um, ensuring that we set an example and continue to lead with our um, allied partners and also um, 
because of the message it sends to our strategic com uh, competitors. I think we have also been uh, very clear, and, and the world has been clear in the unified message that has been, um, that came about after that ASAP test. And I will say that we are not focused on being reactive. Um, typically, we have our own priorities and our goals and our, um, our objectives to meet. But um, I think it gives me, I don't know, it gives me peace of mind that we've got these, these uh, policy goals and priorities that ensure that the U.S. will continue to lead, not just in norms, but in um, pioneering in technology and in um, mitigating climate change and other priorities that uh, at least this particular administration cares about. I'm going to go, uh, let me sneak in one more question here uh, in the front. Hi, um, my name is Danielle. I'm an incoming freshman next year at Purdue. And um, mathematically, momentum is mass times velocity. And I was just wondering what's the idea or the mass that you would like to see progress in the space industry? I know mine, and Gene controls it, so I'll turn it to Gene. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just call on the only person on stage who was a math major? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I. I think the mass, it, at least in the policy world, tends to be sort of what we talked about before, this intersection of um, national and economic security and uh, scientific curiosity and benefits to humans on earth, whether it's, you know, uh, clean energy or, or, or what it is. And um, for us, the velocity is we have to enact our bill every year. We don't always do it on time, but <laughs> we have to do that. Sometimes it's, it's faster and slower. But I, I, I do think that, that um, one of the reasons I said that having hardware was important is because it adds to that mass. It's something you can see. When you see a launch, when you look at a helicopter flight of ingenuity, when you can hear Mars, hear it. How crazy is it that we can hear Mars? Those kind of things are you know, the next rubber band, you add to the rubber band ball, and soon you have the biggest rubber band ball you've ever seen. Well, I, think, I, think, uh, I think that's a, a fantastic uh, a answer there and, and end uh, to our panel here on, uh, on maintaining uh, policy momentum. Uh, but I can't thank you all enough. It's just uh, great to have all four of you uh, for this discussion today.